With the second DLC release, we received an archetype that focuses on skills and keeping them going. This made me wonder if it was possible to craft a build that was good enough that we didn't even need weapons. But going skill only still gives us two skills, and that was a bit easier than what I was looking for, since Way of the Dusa could easily lead us into infinite skill uses. So I decided to try and craft something that can knock down all bosses by only using Quick Draw. It's a skill I always enjoyed, but the recharge time was a big drawback to me before we got DLC number 2. So here's my Quick Draw build and had a Quick Draw only, Remnant 2. As for our build, using Invoker as the main archetype gives us double skill charges, and activating a Quick Draw will regen 10% of the base Quick Draw skill cooldown. The other Invoker perks would be nice, but they require an Invoker skill to be active, except for Entranced, which gives us a nice damage buff. This alone doesn't make for a good experience with recharges though, so I added Legacy Protocol, Black Pawn Stamp, and Burden of the Rebel to get up to 51% skill cooldown. While we could stack more rings, there's a Relic Fragment for another 10% skill cooldown, and then a concoction called Xetoplasm which banks us a lot more. With an investment of 8 points in expertise, this hits the cap of 80% skill cooldown. While this does make the recharge quite fast, there's actually another benefit that's a side effect of Invoker. The text says it reduces skill cooldowns by 10% when you use a skill, but this seems to be on the base value of the cooldown and doesn't account for our reductions. So by clicking Quick Draw more than once, we effectively get half of our recharge time back each cast. This coupled with a reduced cooldown time should keep Quick Draw ready to use almost always, since in realistic combat we won't be shooting every moment anyways. For the last two ring slots we could stack up damage, and the best combo I found was Burden of the Destroyer and Shadestone. Overall, this lands us a solid 1000 DPS when casting like standard, assuming we're not dodging. And if we swap to charge shots, we land over 2000 DPS. This is pretty solid, so for the remainder of my trades, I wound up mostly investing into survivability and dodging improvements. This build functioned quite well throughout my Apocalypse playthrough. So, let's dive into my run through Apocalypse and demonstrate how well it works versus a chunk of the bosses. My first world role was actually the second DLC's version of Yesha. While I normally talk about the overworld experience and strats with my builds, this build didn't really struggle much in the overworld. The only thing to keep in mind is when to use multi shot and charge shot. If you got a standard enemy or a group of enemies, it's generally better to use multi shot. Charge shot is a little less straightforward, but any elite or armored enemy with a weak spot is when it shines over multi shot. That said, there's not any strict reason you need to do one versus the other for survivability, but if you hold the skill key for the charge and hit a weak spot, it does do quite a bit more than the multi shot. The first boss I ran into was Shrewd. I found it easiest to attack while he's charging up an attack since he stays still. It makes hitting his weak spot with the charge shot a lot easier when he's not moving. While there's nothing wrong with using multi shot on him, you can see the massive chunk it takes out of his health bar when you hit him with the charge shot. The only exception to using charge shots on him is if he's on the ground as he moves a lot here, and multi shot will guarantee you can actually hit him. That said, I generally wouldn't recommend attacking him on the ground as it's quite risky. The adds he spawns first rise up in pods and quick draw will actually hit them. Multi shot is definitely superior here, but I found the angling a bit inconsistent and multi shot tended to only hit one pod instead of multiples. Either trying to line up the pods in a near straight line view before shooting or trying to sweep the camera between the pods helps a lot with hitting multiple instead of one. Overall, this was a pretty fair fight, and only took a couple of reattempts to beat. After getting Ledusa's curse, I ran into Kaola. Since Kaola lacks a weak spot, there's not much point in charging up Quick Draw, meaning we can use the standard multi shot for damage. The only strategy I had for this boss was for the tentacles. Since one cast of Quick Draw can't fully take down a single tentacle, it's a bit of a waste to spin cast only on one. So I tried to get two or more into view at the same time, so the shots would hit more than one of them to be a bit more efficient, especially when taking one down. While I generally wouldn't recommend casting in between Kalos attacks, sometimes you just gotta see if you can draw quicker. With access to take down the Yesha world boss, I finally stepped into the ring against Ledusa. This fight was a bit more complex than the last, and we actually need to utilize both multi-shot and single-shot, 
The single biggest issue I had was dealing with the blue orb she spawns. My initial reaction was to use multi-shot to take them down, and to that end it actually did do well. That said, doing so usually meant I didn't have time to hit her directly since I had to dodge them, her attacks, and she would spawn more shortly after I took the first batch down. Not being able to deal damage led to me making more mistakes and the battle being drawn out longer. As it turns out though, you don't need to actually deal with these blue spheres, as you can just strafe past their projectiles and them. While they are active, Charge Shot is superior, otherwise Quick Draw won't focus its shots on her, but if they're not up, the standard Vulture Shot is generally better. Once through the initial phase, her shield opens up and reveals a weak spot. Since the weak spot here is so large, Multishot would never fail to hit it, so I opted for Multishot in the unshielded phase. Once you get her to half health, she pins you in a hallway, and here I always opted for Charge Shot since one cast could knock her out when she does the Pushing Blocks move. This last bit is actually a lot easier than the first part of the fight, and in the end I wound up knocking her health from full to zero in two minutes. With the first world down, I made it to the labyrinth. I know I already went over how to handle the overworld enemies, but I wanted to make a quick note on the labyrinth enemies. Both the standard and elite enemies don't take as much damage from the multi-shot quick draw, but are really susceptible to weak spot damage and the charge shot. The main reason I wanted to point this out is because it's very helpful to know when doing the orb door fight. It's not to say there isn't any benefit to using multi-shot at times, but generally your skill charges are better spent on charge shots. The Labyrinth only has one boss, and that's the Labyrinth Sentinel. While this boss isn't too different from a regular fight, there are two things I'd like to note. The first is that the floating cube near the beginning door is really hard to hit, and I had to basically squeeze against this wall to hit it with a charge shot. Oh, and yeah, if you didn't guess already, we're only using charge shots for this boss, since multi-shots don't lock onto it. The other note I'd like to make is about the projectiles it sends at you. Normally, you would just shoot these, but these require a charge shot to take down with quick draw. While you certainly could spend time and charges to knock them out, I found it better to just avoid them or use a shielded heart ahead of time so I could focus on hitting the actual boss. Otherwise though, there's not really anything else special about knocking the sentinel out with a quick draw. World 2 for me was Namrud, and the Pramachnator was my first roll for boss. While targeting the big flyers isn't difficult, I did find it helpful to take down the one carrying the main boss when it's close to you. Also, towards the end of the fight, it's quite helpful to knock all flyers down in quick succession, since the fight can get quite hectic while they're all still alive. Once the main boss is out of the sky, it's actually fine to use either charged or multi-shot at him. The only downside to going multi-shot is that it can target the little ads, but in my opinion it didn't feel too wasteful even when it did. That said, my preference was to opt for the charge shot, since I found it easier to get into a rhythm of hitting him after he jumps and moves to the side. You might be tempted to go after the little guys with quick draw too, but I usually just ignored them. They're not great at dealing damage, and you're gonna have to dodge anyways to avoid the main boss, which will kill the random ads. This lets you get into a nice rhythm of knocking the boss down, waiting for him to jump at you then dodging, then starting a charge shot and pulling the trigger after he tries to sidestep. This rinse and repeat makes this fight pretty easy overall, and my main struggle was just realizing I should ignore the little guys since I hadn't really done this fight much. With that, I actually got straight to the world boss since I didn't roll the second standard one. This is the first boss I actually needed to worry about the charges on quick draw for. Unlike other bosses so far, there are windows for heavy damage, and there's also an attack that requires multiple quick uses of quick draw. Additionally, after the heavy damage window, adds spawn, so we still need a couple of charges to deal with them. The cycle that I got into looked like this. Only attack Talratha when he opens his mouth and exposes his weak spot, and any other time, unless Quick Draw has four full charges, focuses on dodging and staying alive. When he vomits Ikor at you, get in as many attacks as possible between rolls, and then clean up the ads before falling back to waiting. As I mentioned, if you're fully charged, it is fine to get in some stray shots between attacks, but you don't want to dip your available quick draws down to two or one. The main reason is not actually the heavy damage window, but rather his magic orbs attack. They'll seek you out and explode when they hit. They can be taken down by shooting them, but unfortunately multi-shot doesn't target them nicely and tends to redirect to Talratha, and the charge shot isn't quick enough to knock each one out individually. 
this was what ended most of my attempts at this boss, but I did eventually find a good way to deal with it. When he begins the orbs, shield it hard up and start backing away. The first couple can be tanked with the shield, and then the second set we want to pop right before they hit us. By hitting one when it's really close to the others, the explosion will actually cause the others to explode as well, and therefore the whole set will not hit us. For the remaining orbs, as long as we back away while each set is launched, we have just enough time to shoot out the next set right before they hit us, but it does require some quick gunslinging here to knock them all out. As long as you learn how to deal with the orbs, the rest of his moves aren't too troublesome, and it just comes down to putting enough bullets in him to knock him out. Into the next world and the Bloat King was my first boss in Losum. Honestly, I didn't struggle at all on this one. The orbs always count as weak spot hits, so just use the skill and that's the entirety of my strat on this boss. Further into Losum and I hit the Red Prince, which Quick Draw actually handled really well. The multi-shot cast is really useful versus the ghostly guard since it can lock on and take each guard down at one cast. As for the prince himself, the charge shot is definitely superior. In fact, when he traps you in the center with fire, if you hit a headshot or two it even staggers him and makes this phase a lot more tolerable. The last thing I'll say is really a strategy I like to do more than it is quick draw specific and it just helps prevent dying. While you're not in the fire phase, most of his attacks go out or in directly from him and don't change height. By jumping between the lower and the middle platform, you can wind up avoiding most of his attacks that aren't in the fire phase. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised with how well this build handled the prince since I usually struggle with him, but there really wasn't much else to this one. The Night Weaver is the conclusion to Losum and another boss I'm really not great at fighting. That said, Quick Draw is very effective versus her, especially when she opens her heart. The first shot on the chest should be charged, but then followed by a multi-shot. The multi-shot actually does a great job at auto-targeting the bugs first and landing the last hit on her heart. This makes the bugs not really a threat and a lot easier than the other times I've fought her. Other than this attack, there really isn't anything unique to Phase 1. Dodge the attacks and generally I'd say go multi-shot if her chest isn't open. With the weak spot damage, it's pretty easy to break her heart in the first phase before swapping over to phase 2. If you do so, there's not really any reason to use the charge shot in phase 2. Just like in the first phase, multi-shot can easily handle the bugs, and if she spawns them, they should be dealt with immediately. Other than this, there's nothing unique to this fight with quick draw, but I did find it really helpful to use the stairs to funnel her to make her attacks a bit more recognizable. With all the main worlds down, it's finally time for Root Earth and the first boss, Cancer. While I have occasionally nailed a stray charge weak spot hit on Cancer, this guy moves around a lot, and I generally didn't even try for the charge shots. Multi-shot is also superior because it helps clear out the random branches that Cancer summons if it targets them. The charge shot, on the other hand, won't blast through more than one branch at a time, so I generally avoided it. That said, other than that, Cancer doesn't introduce any unique issues to this run otherwise, and wasn't particularly difficult. I haven't talked about the overworld since the beginning of the video, but the section after Cancer I actually ran into some issues with. There's a particular room with a lot of elites and standard enemies after a couple of standard elite fights. Taking down just an elite or a bunch of standard enemies with quick draw is pretty simple, but the amount here and the fact that enemies spawn behind me actually had me struggling a lot on this section. In fact, I never took the enemies in this section down with quick draw. I just didn't have enough AoE and they kept getting the better of me. So how do you beat an enemy you can't outdraw? You outrun them. So I swapped up my build to the laziest and fastest speed gear I had, which looks something like this, including the train investment. Fun fact, if you've ever struggled with a section, they're not great at chasing you if you're speedy. This was legitimately the easiest way I've ever blazed through this area. With the build back to normal, Venom is the last boss blocking us from annihilation. I'll just say that the last two runs I did had me spoiled a bit on this fight. Strictly speaking, it's more optimal to use charge shot and hit his weak spot, but that's quite difficult to land those shots in the middle of this fight. Multi shot does a pretty decent job at hitting his weak spot, but usually there's one or two bullets that wind up missing it. That said, I found the damage trade off to be worth it to focus on dodging a bit more for Venom, 
Just as I would in a normal fight, circling the building helps a lot with reading his attacks and avoiding some due to having cover. I generally found it easier to cast when I was further away from him or right after he does the spear throw into the ground slam attack. This was actually the boss I spent the most time on out of this run, which may have been due to the lower armor of the outfit I was wearing. As always, the big finale is none other than Annihilation himself. This boss has one giant weak spot, which makes this build perform particularly well against him. This fight can be quite hectic at times, but I generally found it pretty easy to find windows to land a charge shot in. There is an attack I was quite worried about in Phase 1, which is the orb, since I wasn't sure multi-shot would target them. Luckily it does, but I generally needed to cast it twice to knock down the set of 4 orbs. I opted to dodge through the second set, but if you were really quick with your drawing, you could probably knock all of them out consistently. Actually, the auto-targeting of the orbs wound up being extremely helpful in the second phase for the mass orb attack. It only takes three multi-shot casts to knock all of them out due to the lock-on. Multi-shot is also useful for hitting Annihilation in the second phase. With the way his weak spot works in phase 2, multi-shot will pretty much always hit it, so the faster casting time is nice with multi-shot instead of charge shot here. The final note is that if you're feeling pressured in this fight, even in the standard phase, there's no reason you can't click multi-shot over charge shot in the main area. It does generally hit the weak spot, but even if you do lose a bit of damage, this build still does really well versus Annihilation. Overall, he was on the lower difficulties of bosses on this list for the run. I hope you enjoyed this run. I had a pretty fun time slinging bullets around and watching the health bars go down in sections instead of draining one dot. If you did enjoy, consider dropping a like, comment, or a follow to see what kind of challenge runs I have coming up. For now, I'll go back to playing my pacifist build and killing enemies by dodging, as it's actually been quite a lot of fun. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.